Okay, as I said, yesterday it was a little heartbreaking, and I decided I spent half a night uh, on putting together this presentation because I believe it's very important. I didn't plan to, but I think oh, we should know about it. The word authorial sounds quite strange in English because it's a direct translation from Russian and it comes from the word author. So we're talking about the author or the concept or of the school or the educational institution and because of it the adjective is with this suffix and uh, it becomes authorial schools. So the concept was born in Russia 30, 40 years ago and then I was one of the researchers who worked on it. In fact, it was the theme of my postdoc thesis and um, I think, and I found the place for Korchuk in authorial institutions, of course. So I thought it would be important for you to know a little about it. So I'm, yeah. So I tried to find uh, similar, similar terms. In Russian pedagogy, that is innovative schools, experimental schools, authorial schools, as I said, in Russia they use the term. In the U.S. and Canadian as well, that is effective schools, alternative schools, schools of quality, key schools, magnet schools. Now there are several charter schools which go under this rubric and we can go on. So if you take the features of authorial schools and effective schools, there are some commonalities and among them, uh, these are those high expectations of students and teachers, which is, which is a little different from public schools, right? You usually expect that students do well and teachers kind of behind the scenes. Principal as a school leader, not as an authority figure, but as a leader in different things. Favorable environment within the school, Teachers' cooperation, that is mostly famous now in Finland where teachers do what they do and produce the high results because of the cooperation of teachers within school building. Teachers' support of the school mission and goals. Uh, I'm not asking to raise your hands, but those of you who work in schools, who can recite your school mission? J just think about it. Oh, you can. Perfect. So active parents and community participation in the school life because schools never exist in the vacuum, you know. You need the support of the parents or the kids and you need the support of the community. So what are the key indicators which make a school an authorial school? You need first the creator. So if we think about Korchuk's uh, orphan's home, take Korchik out of the picture, what's left? And if there's no person who is following in his shoes, in his steps, nothing will happen. So the figure, and it's not necessarily a charismatic figure, it could be a person who is as humble and not really looking as a school principal because there were situations when new people would come to meet with Korchuk and they would see him in his green kind of uh, gown, like he was wearing a gown like a medical uh, personnel, but not white, but green. And people thought he was a janitor. And they were looking around for someone famous Korchuk and somebody from the kids would say, oh, that's Korchuk. That's Korchuk, really? We thought it's a, it's a cleaning person. So it's not necessarily a figure who is immediately standing out, who is, th there are such, and there's nothing bad about it, but it's not the most important thing. There's also a necessary indicator that is the concept which starts with the school mission and school values, and that's extremely important that uh, it's developed. And a specific culture, 
within a school. I know one great school principal who worked as a school principal for over 60 years. He tended to say, when you come into a good school, you can smell it. You can smell it. And it's not perfume. It's not the smell of children's, you know, something not really pleasant. No, it's the smell of the school culture which unites. And the smell comes from smiles, from friendliness, from openness. Uh, I was about to visit U Hill Secondary School, which is here on campus, and I'm talking with the principal, and uh, I'm saying, Tim, is there any password or I need a permit to park on the premises and then get into the building? You know what he said? He said, Tatiana, this is Canada. He made a pause and said, no permits, come on in. And I came and, and this cool culture, it's openness. I remember my first experience uh, working at a school building with, I told you, the authoritarian school uh, principal who was beyond words authoritarian. So you walk in the corridor and you would never see any child just quietly, comfortably walking if the school principal is somewhere inside. Like, I see her, okay. The first door, immediately in. Yes? Just to say that it's probably uh, similar for a, for a company. A Absolutely. It, because it's based, yeah, it's based on organizational culture concept. Of course, for any institution, children's hospital, say, right? You come in, you are either frightened to death because you're sick, you need help, or you immediately feel like there are toys uh, everywhere, there are pictures on the walls, people approach you with friendly faces, or they look down, they don't talk with you. And this all, believe me or not, it comes usually if there's one personality who is in charge. And he makes clear how, where, what, not in terms of absolute guidelines, but behaving like this. When I was listening, to, for me not to forget this, when I was listening to Wojtek, I remembered, I recommend strongly, there's a wonderful TED talk. It's entitled, Every Kid Needs a Champion. And it's done by Rita Pearson. She's a famous educator. And I, I think 2013, every kid needs a champion. So every school, if you wish, needs a champion. Every educational establishment. So out of all these indicators, I put together this definition. So an authorial school is an establishment usually educational, which has its own unique culture and which is created by a founder and or his follows or her follows. And it's not necessarily that this person works as a school principal. The, this person could be behind the scenes, but if this person trains a team who pick up and use the concept, then it's still an authorial school. The latter, the concept, is accepted and followed by the teachers, school students, and parents. And if any of these elements, teachers or students or parents, do not support the concept and the school culture and the ideas and values, Hardly the school will become really authorial. Because if parents tell the kid at home, you know what, whatever they say at school, it's okay, do as they say, but it's not right. At home, we will tell you what and how. Then it's very different. So the difference is authorial schools existed all the history of mankind. If you think of Plato, if you think of Comenius, 
If you think of Pestalozzi, who I mentioned, who knew the name of Pestalozzi? Like between us, confidentially. Okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, in Europe, every college of education, every faculty of education, every teacher's program has Pestalozzi as part of the curriculum. Because Pestalozzi was an extremely important figure in the Swiss educational horizon. He created a number of schools and orphanages. He was no less of a humanitarian as Korczuk. I want to give you, I, I, I will leave him with you. The, there's lots of written about him you can, you can read or, or listen to different uh, videos about him. What I want to give you, which is not very commonly published, he was not a handsome man, to say the least. And he had a very low self-esteem. So once he fell in love with a beautiful woman, not only beautiful, but also from a wealthy family. So he felt like zero chances. But he wanted to tell her about his love. So he wrote her a love letter, uh, and it was pub I, I read it. I don't know whether it's translated into English. It, it was in Russian in the book of love letters. Pretty incredible. And um, the way he was, uh, he wrote in this letter, he gave her every reason not to fall in love with him. So he's writing to her, telling her about his love, saying, I understand completely. I am this, that, that, and that, and that, which definitely leaves me no chance. And she married him, <laughs> as it happens, because he, he was absolutely brilliant. And another situation, which is also not known, is... Uh, his institution became very famous in Switzerland, and once Alexander II, the emperor of Russia, was visiting, and um, he pretended to be a big humanitarian, the emperor, and he wanted to give money, to donate, so he was talking with, the, with this educator, who was kind of weird, but, you know, kings have to deal with weird people as well. So, but when you... When you stand, I wouldn't give names. We know other people who would tap on the shoulder of the Queen of England, right? But <laughs> uh, he was standing at a distance. Of course, you don't come very close to the king. And Pistolozzi started talking about the necessity of giving education to Russian kids to, to do it, to put more, because Russia was not educated. And he was approaching the king in his agitation closer and closer and closer. And the king had to go backwards and backwards and backwards. And he finally hit the wall behind himself. So Pistolozzi literally kept him in that corner talking with him, passionately telling him about the necessity of education for children. I mean, and then he finally grabbed his uniform, like in agitation, and saying, you need to do it. So imagine the scene, yeah? The emperor of Russia and some Pestalozzi. But that's, that's how he was. So he's he was a very humble person, but when it came to children and education, he was like Korchev. And because of it, it's, it's, very, uh, it, it's very unpleasant, let's put it like this, that uh, he's never mentioned as the one who actually was the first who wrote that hand, head, and heart should be educated together. And that's what he was practicing. So um, there are different types of authorial schools. When there's no continuation, when it's not created as something which can be reproduced, which is totally dependent on the personality, that's what Korczak's institution was at the beginning. Personality in the same building. Then it dies with the death physical or not physical, but the person lives. 
of its creator. And for example, Leo Tolstoy, I told you, who was not only one of the greatest world uh, writers, he was also an educator. He founded, on his estate, he founded this Jasna Polanska school, and he was teaching there, humbly, humbly, because he always considered that um, village children could be much brighter than an educator like him. <clears throat> Vasily Sukhamlinsky, I mentioned him several times. That's the one who wrote the book, the, Cha, the Heart I Give to the Children. And that's another one who was talking about the necessity of hand, heart, and head educated together. He did a number of incredible things. I will name just a few for you to have uh, uh, an impulse to read because his books are translated into English. So he was the first, at, at the time he started elementary school uh, in the village, it was 1947. He came very badly wounded after the Second World War and he was uh, a teacher and then school principal from 1947 to 1970 when he died. So, uh, and he died very early, as you see, yeah, 52 years. So when he started that uh, village school, it's in a village in Ukraine. Ukraine was under Nazis. Everything was burned. Almost no fathers of those kids. Almost no mothers of those kids. Grandparents, kids didn't have anything. And he was the first who said, we should start elementary education not from seven, but from six years old. At the time, it was seven in Russia. And what he suggested, looking at the kids, knowing the countryside and knowing their village life, he suggested to have this first year, he called it a school under the blue skies. From six to seven, this one year, kids were allowed to come bare feet. Living in Seattle, you know, I'm learning. It's okay to walk without socks, without uh, shoes, um, downtown. But at the time, it was much more proper. And, uh, but what he allowed, no school uniform, no shoes, the school under the blue sky was literally the school under the blue sky. All the classes were outside in nature when, when the weather allowed. And it's absolutely phenomenal how differently kids behave when they are in nature. They walk into the forest, they find a lawn, they sit down, they are among the you know, nature, trees, flowers, birds are singing. There's another incredible innovation which is so badly forgotten both in Russia and never known anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, anywhere in the world. That is his room of fairy tales. If you, if you recall yourselves, I'm sure you do, when you were children, Children love fairy tales. Children love when a mother, grandmother, whoever, an adult, sits next to them, read or tell a fairy tale. But at the same time, would you agree, Alice, you work with little ones, yeah? So um, they also are very creative and they can create a fairy tale, right? So picking from this, what he suggested was he put it on the timetable. So once a week, every elementary school child would have a class called fairy tales. A class, mandatory. But the class is in the room which has no furniture, just a rug on the floor, and the figurines from famous Russian fairy tales everywhere. The children sit on the rug in the middle or anywhere they want. And when the newcomers, when they start school, 
they listen to the teacher who tells them fairy tales, but at some point, some kid would always say, let me tell you a fairy tale. I know a story. They don't say a fairy tale. They say a story. I know a story. And then kids start telling stories, and these stories are usually much richer in, in context and, and beauty than the, the teacher's ones. And that's what the teacher wants. So she lets them tell their stories. What they, she does, she says, OK, let's look through the window. Do you see that bird, the squirrel there? Let's name the bird. What's the name of the bird? Tell the adult, let's name the squirrel. It's kind of, yeah, seriously. The kids immediately would come up with different names. And the teacher would say, OK, let's write a story about a squirrel. The kids first don't know how to write. So they create stories orally easily. You know, give kids an impulse, and they would give you a long story, many episodes. What happened to the squirrel today, tomorrow, and how she will live ever after. So they invent these stories. Then they learn how to write. And then the teacher says, OK, now we will write our stories. So during four years of elementary school in Russia today and before, all the grades are together from first to the very end, all through high school, all grades together, like Sigrid was talking about his school. So all grades together. So uh, they were writing these uh, stories, and then in the third or fourth grade, the teacher would say, OK, let's make a book of your stories. So each child would glue together these stories, and they will also put illustrations. So when they graduate the elementary school, they have this book of their own stories, each of them. Now, I think the best innovation comes next. So they give all these books to their teacher, and she keeps them for the next six or seven years. And at the graduation party, because it's the same school. Now, if you recall your own elementary school teachers, we first come short. And the teacher, whatever short she is, she's always taller, right? Then we grow, and the teacher becomes kind of shorter, and then even more, and then the shortest. And then the high school students who are 17, especially boys, they're all like a few heads above. What happens at the graduation party, and, and of course, the period of life, the teens period, it's so rich in different events, they forget about this whole thing. And all of a sudden, here's an elementary school teacher getting on the stage, bringing something onto the stage. It gives me goosebumps even to talk about it, because imagine how emotional it is for kids. And she celebrates their graduation. She says good words about them. And then she says, I have a special present for each of you. And each of these graduates, adults now, they receive each his or her own book of fairy tales. It's like a gift from your childhood. It's like going back to go forward. You know what I mean? Like, this is such an incredible touch of, let me show you, even if you failed in your middle or, or high school, yeah, and if you didn't do well, but you were so creative. Look at what you managed to do when you were a child. And for many of them, it was, you know, a revelation. It was changing their lives. And this is what everything and many other things came with this person. So why is he not known? I guess it's a rhetoric question. Don't you think he should be part of the curriculum together with Korchuk? I'm talking about teacher's training curriculum or professional development. 
because this is, this is the richness of educational thought which is forgotten. And because of that and many others, we're talking about things which should be known. So the next is an authorial school becomes a model, which means it's not one, it's not two, it's not three. It's a cluster of schools which work on the founder's concept. And the founder is not necessarily there. He could be gone physically, but the way the concept was constructed, it can be used in somebody else's hands. You know what I mean? It can be used and reused. So to me, Korchuk is within this uh, concept here. His school, his institution, it's not school per se, but educational institution. That is a model which has been replicated in different variants, and we will be talking today about summer camps which work on his concept. Uh, so this person, if you don't know, I strongly recommend, Larry Kolbeck. He was a very famous moral psychologist who, by the way, committed a suicide. I'm kind of seeing a trend. You heard Bruno Bettelheim yesterday, yeah, committed a suicide. Um, Kolbeck also committed a suicide. So, but uh, his theory about moral stages, stages of moral development, is very, very famous. And he is part of the curriculum in psychology. I'm sure you, you know the name, yeah, those of you who, who started psychology. So he created what is called just community. It is a school within a school. It's usually 100 students. And within a big public school, usually high school, there's this just community where everything is done on a democratic decision-making uh, ground. And I was in different um, just communities visiting, observing. And when I first came to this kind of general meeting, and they were all sitting on the floor, 100 uh, kids, I was looking around. I was the only one sitting on the chair. You know. So I, w I was looking, trying to find one teacher. And apparently there were a few of them. I couldn't really recognize who's teacher, who's a student. It was so blended, you know. It was a real just community. And there were many other things which they are doing. So uh, I can't go into in details about this, but I would recommend to read about just communities. So from a single school, like Sukhomlinsky's school, to be, or Tolstoy's school, to become a model, there are some required conditions. If any of these conditions is not met, it won't work. For example, training of teachers. You cannot come and say, tomorrow we're becoming just community. Hello? And teachers will think to themselves, seriously, for our salary, we're doing what we're doing. Forget it. So you need to train teachers. Cultural translation of a concept is extremely important. If you bring something from the United States, you bring it to a progressive school principal in Russia, for example, you need to translate a number of terms, in, not in terms of translating from English into Russian, but translating from the language of American educational theory into Russian educational theory and practice. Is that clear? We need this cultural translation, otherwise it won't work. The same about Korchak's ideas, by the way to be translated not only in terms of the language, but in terms of the uh, concepts and the language which is known and clear here. Because of that, many translations fail because it's absolutely out of the cultural context. Okay? So, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the name is, yes. Just, uh, yeah. Of course, of course, but when it's funded, uh, there are many other things, you know. Right. There are people who come with money and say, let's do a, but it doesn't work. Because, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but money, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Sure. So uh, when I say to somebody, Rudolf Steiner, who is that? When I say Waldorf schools, everyone knows, right? So that is a marriage because Rudolf Steiner is the founder of Waldorf schools. So uh, that is when schools become a movement. And here are the conditions which show when schools from an authorial single phenomenon and a model become a movement and they can be replicated in different cultural uh, contexts. Another one which I'm sure each of you knows is Montessori schools, practically same thing. You would think Montessori, who is an Italian, lived and worked, if you know, for 12 years in India, the rest of her life, at the end of her life, because she had to flee from Nazism. And Indian culture and Italian culture, European culture, you can imagine the difference. But it worked. In India, there's a huge number of Montessori schools. In the Netherlands, uh, a few years ago, still probably same now, 40% of all elementary schools work as Montessori schools. Again, Dutch culture is very different from Italian culture. So there are these conditions which allow to replicate, but when they are not met, it doesn't work. Um, this person I'm sure known, John Dewey, uh, look at the dates of life. Uh, I always say, you know, living in education probably helps to become a really, really long time survivor, yeah? Over 90 years, and at that period of time, when people hardly lived to 80. So uh, Dewey's idea of progressive schools and what he brought to America was literally changing the horizon, changing the perception of schools, changing what schools should and should not do. And it was like a revolution in education. So a paradigm was changed, and authorial schools became a change of a paradigm. Okay? Now, common features of all the four types I mentioned a school as a single phenomenon, a model, a movement, and a paradigm. Always needed a concept, always needed strong values which are created, known, supported. Always needed a school culture based on humanistic relationships. And Korczuk is talking about relationships everywhere. Every remarkable teacher knows if you don't build relationships first, nothing will work. You can come in with a great curriculum, with a great lesson plan, but if they are not yours, meaning you are not theirs, you know what I mean? Nothing will work. Uh, creativity. I told you several times, uh, I'm never tired to repeat. Children are born with this ability to be creative. They are able to play, invent, do whatever. Imagine the squirrel with the whole, you know, name and, and story. But we kill it. We kill it in kindergartens and then in schools. And if we keep killing, it's gone, it's dead. And then there are lots of boring adults, unfortunately. The results should be stable and they should be effective. Otherwise, the school will not go on. Because if parents and the community doesn't see the results, it won't work. And uh, you start with a few people, supporters, but it's like circles on the water. It goes wider and wider, and it brings in all the 
uh, people who live in the community, parents, former students, and former students become parents of your new students, and they come to school, you know. And ideally, it's a neighborhood with the school which is the center of it. Are you still following it, or it's too much for you to take in? Okay. So most favorable conditions here, Judith, we will come to finance. So there are social, pedagogical, personal, and financial. So if to talk about social, you cannot, you know, start in a thorough humanistic school, which I didn't mention. There could be authorial, authoritarian schools where there is an incredibly authoritarian figure of a school principal and then the whole school culture and everything is under the dominance of this figure. I'm talking only about humanistic schools. I didn't research authoritarian, although it could be an interesting topic as well. So there should be a social political order structure which allows this type of school. You can't imagine something like this in the Nazi Germany as a public school, right? So you need a social order. And you need what I call social soil. And also the best way is cultural traditions which exist already in this particular culture, which allow it. Because if you bring something great but it's so different, it's so alien, it won't work. You probably know that Russia is famous for potatoes, but you probably don't know that Peter the Great brought potatoes first to Russia and no one wanted to use them because they were so different, they were absolutely not part of what agricultural community would use. And then it took years and years to actually adopt it, accept it, make it yours. So until you really make it yours, when you can say, my school, and think of the language as well. When you say, my school, or you go to my school, or you go to the school, you go to work, or you go to my school, you say, you hear the difference? This immediately shows whether you adopted it. It's just a place of work or you go there because it's yours. Another test is when children go to school and the body language and the children leave sc the school building. So the children go to school, they're smiling, they're happy, they're open, they come into the building a little earlier, they sit down, they use time to prepare, that's my school, and the last bell rings. In bad schools, the bell is still ringing, the entrance door is already open from inside, running out, running out. If they're running out of the school building, something is wrong there. <laughs> something is definitely wrong. They don't want to be in the building. So another a uh, set of conditions is uh, pedagogical. So, as I said, teachers, staff should be able to accept this new and non-traditional type of work. And potentially, they should be ready. They shouldn't be very rigid in their minds. Then they should be definitely a charismatic leader or a person who is not charismatic, as I said, but who is ready to lead, who has a vision, and of course funding. At the same time, Sukhamlinsky about funding was working in a village school which doesn't have a roof because 1947, Villages destroyed absolutely fully by fascists. So what he did, he showed the parents and whoever families remained that the school was so worth it that the community rebuilt the school, the village. Here's one example how the village remembers Sukhamlinsky to this day. So I visited this school 
with, this, with my students, teachers-to-be, in 1989, he died in 1970. How many of you would go to the gravestone of your former teacher, even if, or school principal, even if he was great, 19 years after he died? And you are an adult, you moved on. So we went to the museum, which is within the school building, and it's in his apartment. He lived in the building. And then we went to the village cemetery. And believe me or not, on a regular day, no holiday, no nothing, no Remembrance Day, there were fresh flowers on the gravestone. Lillian, come on in, please. There were fresh flowers on the gravestone. Does it tell you anything? So no words needed. There was, of course, a huge portrait of him on the wall of a school building. How many portraits we have? We pass by their part of the furniture. We don't just stop you and ask, what kind of a portrait you just pass by? You would not always remember, right? Because portraits, when they are not meaningful, they remain just piece of the wall. But the gravestone, no one knows. You go to the cemetery, you put flowers on the gravestone. Who would say, oh, good man, or go good woman, or great? No one, right? You do it out of your heart because you remember this teacher. That's a merit the teacher had. So what prevents or allows authorial schools to develop? They could die, as it happened with the Sukhamlinsky school, the authorities did everything for the school to become mediocre. They put an authoritarian school principal. They did everything to literally put the school down the hill and just pushed it down the hill. And it happened. I mean, it, it's still there. It's a nice building, uh, but nothing like what it was. So dependence on the personality. If the dependence is very strict, on the personality of the founder, then the founder is gone, the school is gone. And very quickly, can you relate to this? Uh, the next one is value core. So if values are created and they're so strong and they're accepted by teachers and parents and students, then they stay. But if they are fully attached to the personality of the leader, then the leader is gone and the values are gone. And the next one is this component of methods, strategies, interventions, which are so developed that they will be in use after the person is gone. So any of these three not there, the school will not become something in the future. So the school culture is a function of four components. It's, it's on purpose. I put this one, number one, horizontally and others kind of equally because the culture of the school principal, and when I say culture, I don't mean he's uh, an educated person. I don't mean he knows culture that well. I mean his educational culture, his relationships culture, the way he behaves, the way he treats people, the way he teaches. So the culture of the school principal, the system of values, cooperation and partnership, and orientation of school, creative orientation of school activities. I'm usually using this medical term, I'm saying, a good uh, school culture is contagious. You get sick with this beautiful culture. You accept it immediately. Would you agree with that? That's about the smell of the school. You come in, you smell it. It's wonderful, and you're right there. And I usually give my students the example, you eat a candy and you have paper left, right, in your hand. And you walk in an extremely clean street. You would keep it in your hand. You will not drop it accidentally, kind of. I don't say, I just, yeah. 
but you will keep it because it's kind of, it's contagious. Everywhere is clean, clean and all of a sudden you drop it. But you walk in a dirty street, then one piece more, one piece less. It's contagious again. So positivity as much as negativity could be contagious. And that's what Korchak did as well. The atmosphere of the school was so contagiously good that it spread out of the walls of the building. It covered a lot of Warsaw Ghetto, although the conditions, the situation was so incredibly harsh. You know what I mean? So uh, that's about how a school could become humanistic or not humanistic and the functions. And I, I want especially uh, concentrate on number, one, on number four. Such schools always existed in the world, in the history. And what they did, and they still do, they show other educators and the community and politicians and everyone this hope in the world of education. Here's one school. It could be small. It could be somewhere, nowhere, but it exists. And there's hope. And I want to finish this with uh, a very different concept, but I think it relates. There's a movie. A, 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 documentary which is based on research and the research is made on the concept of happiness so there's a group of researchers who actually started who is most happy in the world and they have indicators and they traveled all over the world and what they realized happiness absolutely does not depend on the amount of wealth on the society where you live, <coughs> excuse me, whether it's developed or not developed, it depends on absolutely different factors. In fact, most happy are people living under very humble circumstances, not having a lot. They're smiling, they're positive, they're happy. So. If it's possible to say that children in Korchuk's home were happy, I think at least he made everything possible and impossible to make them feel happy. Was he happy? No. He was a sad man, understanding, as an old Jew, as they say, understanding what's coming. He was sad. And I will read to you, not now, uh, there's an incredible small book which he wrote. It's published. It's called uh, The Praise of Those Who Don't Pray. And uh, there are prayers uh, like a prayer of a mother, a prayer of a little girl, a prayer of a student, and there's also a prayer of a teacher. So I, I would read it to you. I strongly recommend to read the whole thing. But uh, I want to leave you with this. I, I apologize for bringing this concept, which was out of our plan originally. But I thought it's important to know the world is much bigger, the world of education, than people consider today or yesterday. There are many centuries behind us. Questions? If there are no questions, let's have a short break. Um, seven and a half minutes. Jane, yeah. Well, I don't have a question. Yeah. But I have a comment. Absolutely. And comments as well, of course. About, um, when you talked about how children have this innate sense of play and, and yeah. creativity that in some places that just gets killed in them, <clears throat> I would say that you end up with um, often, not always, but often with adults who have very little self-esteem and very little sense of their own power. And I and I and the more we are here, the more I feel what Korchak 
instilled in the children was a sense of their own power. Yeah. And dignity. Yeah. But what I also wanted to say is that it doesn't take an enormous amount to rekindle that creativity in adults. It, I mean, I mean, I, I, I would I, agree with I, that. I would I, agree I, with I mean, that. I know that there's a danger in taking the one experience and, and, and uh, expanding on it, but I've experienced that any number of times in my own work with adults. Mm -hmm. And they're usually, when that happens, they can remember when it was extinguished mm -hmm. and they're furious. That why it was killed. Yeah, the, but yeah. yeah they, rem they may not know why, but they remember the moment when it, they shut down. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to open it again. And, and you know, so I don't know that, they're in, that they intrinsically then go on to become boring, but if there's somebody around who can open Mm -hmm. the door again, then it's it's all just sitting there. It's like the child is inside one of the Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, adults, absolutely. Like right yeah, in yeah, yeah, the yeah. waiting. Yeah. So there's hope. There's yeah. hope for adults as well. Yeah. yeah. Other comments, Alice, do you want to say? Yes, let me just want to share like um uh, and, uh, personal experience because I was working with children since like five years ago and I used to live in Victoria, BC. They do have a forest school there. And then uh, for children age three to six and then uh, what they do is like the whole day they spend outside uh, in the forest. Um, mm. And then uh, there's like two teachers leaving the whole room, mm -hmm. and they just pack their own lunch. Uh, and then they just sit on the like. Uh, so table. you were observing or you were there? Oh, I, I was like doing my practicum there. Uh -huh. So, uh, not so how different is this school? Um, what so you say? I think, yeah, children are really enjoying that, but uh, for the, it's not, uh, it's not quite mainstream. Mm -hmm. in, in Canadian like education mm -hmm. system because um, you, you can see there are only like 10, 10 children they never really have a full class oh, because okay. there are like not many parents are willing to send their children to there especially in the winter time they feel like oh the children the children the children get sick no one have yeah. but actually children are really enjoying it okay 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 you want to say something mm -hmm. oh um, I think that cultural translation piece kind of spoke to me in terms of how we are trying to implement a social pediatrics program to circle the child here in Vancouver um, in a completely different, you know, with a different population and, and different considerations to make. So I think as Alicia and I are doing the course, we're kind of processing that. And so that spoke to me in your presentation, just really been thinking about that and what that looks like in terms of cultural translation. Translation. Because there are cultures which are community oriented. In this culture, is making a circle like this, and here's a circle. There yes. are cultures which are individually oriented, individualistically, I should say, oriented, and Western cultures are mostly like this. And then making a circle, formally and informal, is much more difficult, right? And yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the population we deal with in terms of creating a circle, um, you know, we have different sort of huge, huge, huge very good yeah. challenges to overcome. Or like, you know, I don't want to say it in a negative way because it's yeah. not necessarily that, but you know, making those considerations and and figuring out, you know, how we can go about this work in a way that works and is safe for the population that we work with. Right. Because they will fall out of the circle if they don't feel safe. Absolutely. They will not even come to the circle yeah. if they don't feel yeah. safe. Yeah. So yeah. how are we going to do that? Yeah, that, that's fine.